Ooh. Hello, everybody, and welcome to um, AER Live, um, a series of online interactive workshops from Applied Ecological Resources. Uh, my name is Paul Haddon Leach. I am the UK business development consultant and bioacoustician bio uh, at Wildlife Acoustics, and I'm delighted that you're all here. I think we have a, a, a problem with a link that um, people are following, so we may get people sort of joining in dribs and drabs but i'm sure the numbers will be going up as we we kind of get talking and everything else um but it's great to have you all here um wildlife acoustics are sponsoring today well i'm from wildlife acoustics so i'm, I'm not going to thank myself for sponsoring it but we are sponsoring today uh, and the, the relaxing soundscape you heard at the start um uh, is I, I kind of recorded it in northern borneo so i'm kind of quite proud of that one it's a it's better than muzak to have sort of chilling out in the background um so what who wildlife acoustics are is um we're the leading provider of bioacoustic monitoring technology for biologists researchers government agencies you name it um and if you want to know more about our products and that sort of thing then please visit our website wildlifeacoustics.com okay so there's the there's the promotion done we'll 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 move on to some proper stuff now um this month's AER Spotlight is on uh, Richard et al.'s Practice Insight article, a collaboration between local Indigenous and visiting non-Indigenous researchers, uh, published in AER's peer-reviewed journal, um, Ecological Solutions and Evidence. Uh, in the short communicative piece, um, Canadian government agency scientists present a practical case study in which they work with Inuit communities to, to successfully co-deliver um, a multi-decade long monitoring program in the Canadian Arctic. Um, they demonstrate the power of combining indigenous and Western scientific methods for data collection, but also draw attention to the gaps that still exist between best practice of collaborative research and factors that hamper their practical implementations. So a uh, fantastic article. The link is at the bottom uh, and we'll also pop that in the chat as well. So you can just go and click on that. Um, so please go and have a look at the, the full link. Um, but we do encourage other part. Uh, practitioners to share such case studies and insights like this so we can continue to build upon existing evidence to improve ecological practice always good and as i'm predicting we're getting a nice long flood of people which is brilliant now hello everybody who just joined us and you're just in time i get to introduce two speakers um so i'm going to shortly hand over to two speakers today um dr oliver metcalf and gavin ward uh, but before we do um kind of a few rules, I suppose, of Zoom. I suppose we've all been using Zoom for the last three years. We should all know about this now. But anyway, um, this uh, workshop will be recorded and posted online. Um, so it, please keep your cameras off and muted um, and, unless we um, say, please unmute and ask your question or something similar. Um, please send any questions or comments for the speaker um, via the Zoom chat, um, and we'll share these during the Q&A sections of the workshop. You can send them at any time. I'll keep monitoring the chat, and I'll try and pull those questions out um, as, as time sort of uh, marches on. If you get any issues, if there's any problems, any technical issues, uh, please pop these in the chat as, as well. The AER team is also on hand just to make sure that the te technical issue isn't just you, it's, it might be everybody, you know, we want to make sure this runs as smoothly as possible. So um, please, 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 any problems, pop them in the chat. Um, so I think really now we've got loads of people attending. Um, I think I should hand over really. Um, so let me introduce Dr. Oliver Metcalf and Gavin Ward for their workshop, Why and How to Set Up Successful Ecoacoustic Study. Over to you, Gavin. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's session. Um, I'll just wait for Ollie to get the first slide up and we should be good to go. Great. Um, so just a quick introduction. My name's Gavin Ward. I'm um, the Consultancy Director for Baker Consultants. And my main technical background is actually in ecological impact assessment, which I've been doing for the past 20 years. Um, before Ollie takes you through the main part of the session and um, go through the main technical details. I'm just briefly going to talk a bit about how the big consultants have been involved with ecoacoustic methods and some of the new areas that we're currently developing. And as you'll see, that sort of led into our involvement with the production of these guidelines. 
So we're a commercial consultancy, um, ecology only, uh, but we have a quite a strong focus on best practice and we pride ourselves on trying to do as much innovation as we do. Um, and when it comes to eco-acoustic survey methods, similar to most people in our part of the sector, um, our acoustic work started with bats. Um, and we were one of the first companies to get our hands on wildlife acoustics, first full spectrum bat detectors. Um, and similar to everybody else, as they became commonplace, we developed that as part of a core service. And that obviously mirrored the evolution of the bat survey, bat conservation trust survey guidelines as they became well used for transects and static surveys. As a natural extension of that, um, some of our ornithologists then began to evolve a methodology to use static acoustic detectors for bird surveys. And that built as an extension on a lot of the, the excellent work done by the Cornell University team who are responsible for bird nets and obviously the lots of other um, bird ID call apps and websites and databases being built around the world. Um, so we looked to use ecoacoustic detectors as a way of supplementing our standard breeding bird and wintering bird surveys. And we've actually been using static detectors as part of our wintering and breeding bird survey work uh, for the last two or three years on all our sites. That then led on to us authoring the passive acoustic survey methods chapter for the new bird survey guidelines. Um, and in the next few weeks, we've got a white paper coming out explaining a bit more background on that. And we'll touch on that a bit later after we've heard from Ollie. The, the final bit of our bioacoustic jigsaw is um, our director of bioacoustics, Carlos Abrahams, who some of you may know. Um, unfortunately, he can't be here today, um, but he completed a PhD uh, last November, and that was a springboard for us looking into ways to use ecoacoustic methods for measuring soil health. And we're currently doing a DEFRA funded research project with the team at the University of Warwick. And we're looking at ways to monitor earthworm populations and their relative health um, using soil acoustic techniques. And then our, our hope is that we're going to build a bioacoustic database across a range of soil types and land uses, and hopefully in the future, use ecoacoustic methods for monitoring arable soils, vineyards, BNG sites, rewilding, and potentially in time, using it for targeted species-specific surveys within the soil. Um, it is still quite early, early days, but there are lots of promising results coming out. So as a result, um, through Carlos's connections within the bioacoustic network, um, we were heavily involved in the guidelines and worked with Ollie and the other authors to help produce those. And hopefully some of you have had a chance to read through those before this call. The last thing I want to do before I hand over to Ollie is we've got a quick poll that we would like you guys to fill out for us. And it's just to gauge the general level of awareness of ecoacoustic methods that there are on this call. Um, so I'm just going to launch the poll now and we'll give it a few seconds. And then if you guys could just, there's just three short questions and then we'll be able to hand over to Ollie. Great, okay, we're uh, we're well over two thirds complete. So uh, instead of you guys looking at me, sat looking at my own screen, I'll hand over to Ollie and he'll run you for the next phase and we'll perhaps come back to these answers at the end. Cheers. Oh, yeah. Um... Yeah, hi, so uh, I'm Oli Metcalf. I'm currently a postdoc at Lancaster University. Uh, prior to that, I had uh, a stint working with Baker Consultants over, over the summer uh, and um, was a, did my PhD and a postdoc at Manchester Metropolitan U University um, using ecoacoustics to monitor all sorts of biodiversity, primarily in Amazonia rather than the UK, um, but have a huge amount of interest in UK biodiversity as well. So um, today we're going to talk through um, how to set up and design uh, a long-term eco-acoustic monitoring program. And that has grown out of, and that's um, developed from these good practice guidelines uh, that we published earlier this year. Um, and in, in turn, those, why is it not changing slide? There we go. Uh, in turn, those guidelines came from a symposium that we hosted at Manchester Metropolitan University. I, I see there's a few people in the audience today who attended that, which is great to see them again. Um, and that was really an effort to get people 
all together from all sorts of different backgrounds, whether that was industry, uh, government, NGOs and academia, all together to discuss uh, both the benefits and the challenges of, of using acoustics for long term biodiversity monitoring, uh, particularly in the UK and particularly focused on uh, acoustics within the human audible range. So for the bat people, I apologise, I don't know an awful lot about bats. I've been told there's quite a lot of overlap and this is quite useful for designing bat surveys, but we are going to focus on um, the audible acoustic spectrum. So that's primarily birds, some insects, uh, terrestrial mammals. Um, and we, we, we're we also going to keep it terrestrial so we don't have the added complication of how to deploy recorders in water. Um, largely because there are already existing guidelines for uh, very good guidelines for bat monitoring and um, some guidelines for cetacean monitoring too. So we didn't want to overlap with what, what's already been done there. So as I mentioned, this was a massive collaborative effort. There was 160 people attended the event at MMU, whether that was online or in person. Uh, and out of that, uh, some, of, some of the people kindly stayed on and helped publish uh, the guidelines, which was really just intended as a reflection of, of the discussions and the outcomes of, of that uh, symposium. It's certainly not anything that any one person has dictated. There's a, a real team effort here, uh, which was fantastic. And again, you can see that the, uh, the co-author team is made up of a range of uh, academics, scientists, uh, NGO professionals and uh, government so to give you a quick overview of what the guidelines look like, uh, so it exists as an executive summary. So for those of you who don't have the time to read the whole thing, uh, a very quick overview of the main take home messages, uh, an introduction to acoustic monitoring in general, uh, hardware design, study protocol, data exploration, and then the two types of analysis uh, paradigms that you can really the most acoustic studies fit into. So that's targeted monitoring when you're looking at specific specific species or a specific group of species uh, and soundscape analysis when you're looking at the energy um, across an entire soundscape rather than any particular taxa. And that's the structure we're going to uh, I'm going to talk through today as well for developing uh, study design. I just wanted to point out that um, well. Ecoacoustics in general has a huge amount of jargon that sort of that seems to come with any technology subject, any technology field. Uh, and I can be a little bit guilty of using jargon. Uh, hopefully I won't today, but we put a huge amount of effort into developing a brilliant glossary. Um, there's some master students who work really hard on this, uh, and it's I think it's over two pages long of all the different terms that we could think of that we were going to use. Uh, that are related to um, acoustics or, or passive acoustic monitoring in any way. And that's in the guidelines. So do refer to that if you're getting a little bit lost at any stage or in general, um, if uh, you feel the need you're reading acoustic papers and you don't understand what's going on as I often do. So the, the introduction, uh, an introduction to passive acoustic monitoring. So the the guidelines follows the sort of the standard approach now of many acoustic papers of discussing uh, the positives, the advantages and the disadvantages of using passive acoustic monitoring, particularly in comparison to uh, traditional human led uh, monitoring of taxa. So I'm not going to go into a massive amount of detail. Um, there's a good table in there that you can refer to. Uh, but essentially, one of the biggest benefits that people talk about with ARUs, which is autonomous recording units. Uh, so that's devices that can be left in the field for, for long periods of time to record without human presence, is that they can be used to record uh, soundscapes over extended and extremely long periods of time and collect a huge amount of data like that. So it does lend itself very well to long term monitoring studies in that there is a lot less effort required than many other monitoring techniques to get longitudinal data, which can be highly beneficial. Uh, we also have a section in there on soundscapes from a human perspective, which is uh, really interesting. It's not something you often uh, come across in uh, ecoacoustic papers. So it's interesting to consider how uh, soundscapes could be analyzed 
uh, from a human perspective. And that also fits much more into uh, the traditional consultancy way of analyzing sound and analyzing soundscapes, as opposed to uh, the way that I look at it, which is much more of an ecologist perspective. So it's trying to bridge the gap between the two there. And then finally, the, the introduction ends with a couple of uh, warnings, really, that uh, technology is not a replacement for human expertise. We can't just replace uh, ecological expertise built up over decades with either uh, a recording unit or an algorithm. Uh, the human capacity to contextualize ecological data is still incredibly important and is nowhere near uh, close to being replaced by any of the technology I'm going to talk about today. So it's still really important to have experienced and knowledgeable ecologists on any project that you're going to do. Um, and these guidelines are not a replacement for that human, human expertise either. As much effort as we've put into them, uh, you still probably need to consult some real experts on any long-term monitoring project you're setting up. So the other thing I was going to do as we go through um, is I'm going to have a, a hypothetical case study uh, so that we can contextualize everything that we're discussing as we go through. So in this case study, we've been asked to monitor Skitwith Common uh, uh, National Nature Reserve for 10 years, uh, except it's it's a completely, it's not Skitwith Common because that's a real place. It's a completely fictional version of Skitwith Common uh, and definitely not just the nature reserve that's down the road from my house. Uh, and that's an important lowland heath habitat in the mythical country of Yorkland. Uh, and its major impacts are from disturbance, scrub encroachment and nutrient enrichment like almost all lowland heath in the UK, it gets abused by dog walkers. Um, but it's listed because it's got significant populations of woodlark, nightjar, curlew and wintering wildfowl. And because the rules of UK biogeography don't apply in Yorkland, uh, we also have some natajack toad populations there. And the desired outcomes, so, Normally, when you get given a long-term monitoring project, you're you're given either, either one of two things, a budget or some desired outcomes, and sometimes both. So in this case, we're going to uh, assume some desired outcomes uh, and try and uh, fit our monitoring guidelines around that. So uh, the outcomes here are an assessment of the change in habitat using a soundscape analysis and two targeted studies to assess the changes in site use by curlew over a decade and the changes in relative abundance of natajack toad uh, over the next decade. And at this point, we're just going to have a quick pause and do another very quick poll to see how people would, su would set up a study design, some of the major questions and how they do it. Please don't think about this too much. It's just a snap response. You can't be wrong. Um, do it like those word quizzes where you give your first instinctual response. Um, otherwise, today's going to go on forever. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if you can just very quickly answer those those poll questions. Okay, I think at, at this point, uh, I'm going to stop the poll just because we've got 75% of people participated uh, and we can move on. And uh, we'll have a look at those answers at the end and we'll rerun the poll at the end and see if any of the answers have changed. Uh, but it's it's quite interesting that the very few people would go for the most expensive acoustic units. Uh, I, I, that's quite surprising. Uh, and most people would record two minutes and 10, 24 hours a day. Okay, cool. Uh, so the first thing to consider often in these studies is uh, your hardware choice. Um, so in the guidelines, we go through AI specifications and what they mean. So this is things like the sampling rate, uh, the frequency response, and a whole lot of other jargon that can be important in choosing between uh, a range of different hardware that's out there. We also have a table that compares uh, the commonest ARU brands that are available for sale in the UK. We don't recommend any particular one. We just give the options and their different uh, specs. Uh, I'm guessing that's probably already out of date. But as things come through, Paul was telling me that uh, so, uh, Wildlife Acoustics have a couple of new models coming out soon. 
Uh, and the same for the microphone specs. Again, so um, what the different aspects, the different techn uh, technological jargon around the microphones mean, that's all discussed. And then some tips on maintenance and calibration, which is really important and different, especially for long-term uh, studies, maintenance and calibration is, is really quite vital to make sure that data is comparable over the years. Uh, and some of the units are probably easier to maintain and calibrate than others. Uh, and then the the key problem when you're considering hardware for, for setting up recording uh, long-term monitoring studies is the cost trade-off. So generally, the better models are going to have a better signal-to-noise ratio. So that means that the background noise will be lower, which means that you have a larger area of recording. So you'll detect more things using a higher quality recording device. Um, the other things that might be beneficial over a long-term study is things like a, a removable microphone, detachable microphone, which means that you can then replace the microphone as it degrades rather than the whole unit. Um, and sometimes the casing can be a lot better quality, a lot more waterproof, which means that they're more likely to last for longer. So you don't need to replace them for quite as long. Um, so in the case of our, uh, our hypothetical case study, uh, I think if it was my choice, I would go for the, the medium selection in the poll, have 20 units uh, for covering a relatively large area, kilometer, kilometer or two by kilometer or two. It's probably not enough to only have 10, 10 recorders covering that whole area, You're not gonna good spatial coverage, even though uh, you cover a slightly larger area per each unit. And I think if I was doing long-term monitoring over a decade, the lower cost models such as AudioMoth uh, would need replacing on too regular a basis, I think, depending on what casing you're using and that sort of thing. Uh, so I think I'd be looking at sort of the mid-range models, uh, something like the Song Meter Mini or uh, the Titley Chorus, uh, something like that, and trying to get uh, a good number of them out there. But context is everything and uh i don't think there's particularly a wrong answer here for any of the uh, options so yeah so moving on to the third chapter in study protocol uh and this comes back to one of the things we were just talking about the detection distances which is completely vital uh component of acoustic analysis but one that is rarely done because it's so difficult um so understand, understanding the area that you're uh, covering with each recorder is vital in making sure that uh, data is comparable across space and over time. Um, but in general, we've tended to just assume that the recording areas are fairly equal and that they don't vary very much. Um, We've, I've just been at a workshop, uh, the EcoHack in Sterling, which is very useful. And we've had a discussion about how to uh, make long-term studies more, more comparable, especially with changing hardware over time. By the end of our decade in our case study, it's very unlikely that we'll actually be able to purchase any of the same models that we've started with at the start. So I think there's there's a couple of approaches you can take. There's some very good papers uh, by Sylvain Holper and uh, by Daniel Yip uh, that have experimentally figured out how to work out detection distances. Uh, they are quite involved. There's a degree of cost involved in buying things like uh, sound meters. It's probably necessary in most cases, or you could try and borrow one. Um, but I would certainly make sure that any long-term study builds in at least loose calibration in the sense of playback at a set amplitude from a set distance from the recorder on a regular basis, whether that's every six months or every year, and at sort of 10, 20, 30 meters at various directions from the recorder to check how the recorder is performing and to see if there's signs of, of deterioration over the lifetime of those recorders. Again, it's something that's very rarely done. I've, I've done multiple studies where I haven't done that, but I increasingly think it's, it's very important to do that. Uh, and we discussed some of the ways that you can do that in the guidelines. And we should have a uh, discussion piece coming out soon, a perspective piece coming out soon from the Sterling Eco Hackathon on that subject. Um, and then before determining the 
exact placement around the site of uh, your AOUs, it's worth considering how you're going to put them out. Um, ARU microphones are generally omnidirectional, so that should mean that there's a 360 degree circle around the microphone that is recording with equal uh, capacity in all directions. That's very, very rarely true. I, th I think never true for all microphones. There's always a degree of directionality, uh, which varies depending on things like the microphone placement inside the recording unit, but also importantly, how you're attaching the microphone to the environment. So placing a microphone on the tree I see here, uh, it's going to be less impacted because there's a stalk coming out from the, I think that's an SM4, song meter four from Wildlife Acoustics, which will mean that it's not directly blocking the sound, although there will still be a degree of sound attenuation from the direction the tree is attached to. Um, most studies place recorders one to two meters off the ground. Again, the height of the, uh, if you're trying to record canopy species in a forest, putting the recorder in the canopy will make a difference compared to putting it lower down on the ground where you'll get mostly ground species. Um, but actually, I think the biggest consideration here is not the ideal physics of where you're recording things, but the reality of if you're putting expensive electronic equipment around public spaces in particular, um, it's better to ensure that they aren't stolen. So again, there's a trade-off here. People are pretty bad at looking above eye level. So placing uh, devices above eye level can be quite effective and placing them just back inside vegetation can be quite effective as well. Although you will end up inevitably picking up some wind rustle from leaves and vegetation. But I know with uh, Baker Consultants, we would often place um, the recorders just inside bushes and as long as the bushes were relatively sheltered from the wind it didn't seem to be massively impactful um it certainly impacted the 360 uh, sound collection but it's not going to impact hugely on the quality of the sound i don't think and that's something to bear in mind when you're thinking of of your detection space as well and also there's just some very in there's uh some research we've referenced in the guidelines that's quite interesting that shows that leaving uh polite notices on recorders as opposed to neutral or aggressive messaging, asking people not to steal them because they're there for scientific purposes is the most effective way of deterring people from uh, stealing all your stuff. So uh, something to think about if you're going to leave some notices on recording devices. Uh, so yes, so for our case study um, deployment, I was thinking I would place them on small trees at about two and a half meters above eye level. Uh, something with a diameter of about 10 centimeters shouldn't block out too much sound, hopefully. Uh, and I was going to place uh, 10 of my recorders in a grid across the site, an evenly placed grid, so we got a good idea of the soundscape across the site. And then I was going to selectively place 10 of the recorders around wetland areas so that we could use that data for uh, curlew and natterjack toad um, specific studies. So again, it's not necessary when you're setting up long-term monitoring to have just one study design. The, the joy of having lots of recorders is you can have nested designs. Uh, and then interlinked with the, uh, the spatial considerations are the temporal considerations. So in general, there's uh, three levels to, to, to think about when you're thinking of uh, uh, leaving recorders out. So the first of all is the deployment schedule. So that's how long your recorders are going to be left in the field for. Uh, so that relates to the poll question. Uh, actually, it's sort of the poll question goes across these. Uh, so you may wish to leave the uh, recorder in the field all year round from sort of January to December. That would be continuous. Or you may try and target different periods. So that might be uh, one recording a month for a week or it might be for a month of each season, uh, but any sort of non-continuous uh, sampling like that. And then the next two aspects to consider is uh, what's referred to as the recording period or the sampling schedule or duty cycle. So the these two are, are heavily interlinked. So you might have a recording period. This is the bottom plot here where you have a 24 hour continuous recording period but the sampling schedule is only two minutes and 10. This is a very common way of sampling for uh, soundscape studies. 
and sometimes for taxonomic, especially community-based studies as well. Um, or you might want to have a non-continuous recording period, so that might be targeting dawn and dusk, but a constant sampling period. So that might be something if you're recording from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and again from 5 p.m. in the evening to 9 p.m. in the evening to target, for instance, the dawn chorus and the dusk chorus, that can be a very effective way for uh, taxonomically targeted studies. Uh, again, built into that, that something to consider is uh, especially for studies where you're trying to optimize uh, the number of species that you're detecting, so sort of community-based studies, um, the way that you disperse your samples can have a big effect. So this is a study I did in uh, the tropics, although I think it applies uh, to uh, temperate regions as well. We, we recorded the dawn chorus and we took four 15 minute so samples and 240 15 second samples from each site. So that's an hour of data from each site. And what we found was that the 240 15 second samples, so that's blue on these plots, was far, far more effective at recording both alpha and gamma diversity than the four 15 minute samples. So dispersing a lot of short samples over a longer period of time is likely to be a more effective way of uh, detecting species richness, if that's what you're interested in in your study. So for our case study, uh, here my thinking was, and feel free to come up with your own uh, suggestions in the poll at the end, uh, was that we would record all year round for two minutes and 10, but we would have one week in April, May, June, July, and August where we would record continuously for to allow uh, targeted surveying of the curlews and natterjack to toads during the warmer breeding periods, uh, but a good annual cycle of data for two minutes and 10 for the rest of the year, that will increase the effort of having to go back to those recorders uh, for those weeks in between where the batteries won't last as long. So that is the downside to getting that extra data in that period. Uh, and then finally, device settings. This is one of the places that the guidelines have made um, some strong recommendations uh, on how to do it rather than just a discussion of the options. Uh, and this is to try and uh, improve comparability across different studies uh, so that people are using similar settings so that the data is, is increasingly comparable. So we recommend recording in WAV format, a bit depth of 16 bits, that may be something that's changing over time. I noticed that some of the acoustic recording companies, uh, device companies like Zoom are increasingly making only 32-bit recorders. But for now, a uh, bit depth of 16 is, is more than enough. Uh, a 48 kilohertz sampling rate. So uh, Nyquist frequency dictates uh, the relationship of the sampling rate and what audible uh, sampling, what audible frequency you can actually listen to and use. So it's half. So if you record at 48 kilohertz, you can use uh, the acoustic data up to 24 kilohertz, um, which is the human audible uh, spectrum stops at about 18 to 20 kilohertz. So it's way above that. There's plenty above that. Recording should be one minute in length. That's really just a practical thing. It's much easier to handle one minute uh, samples, a lot of the acoustic indices are set up to run over one minute. Uh, and gain settings we are going to be varied by which device you're using, but they should be kept consistent. And you should know what that actually means in terms of adding decibels to the sound level. Uh, and finally, something that's often not considered enough is data storage. Data storage remains a huge challenge and, and a big carbon sink, actually. If you look at the cost of storing a terabyte of audio data is, is quite a lot of carbon. So it's definitely something that projects should consider when they're setting out for long-term monitoring. Uh, the general guidance for all, uh, all data, electronic data, is that you should aim for at least three copies of every file in at least two independent locations. Um, and just a warning from personal experience is that cloud storage is still quite an expensive option and that uploading and downloading large amounts of data for storage and for analysis can be quite slow. Um, and a note on what the Australian Acoustic Observatory, which is a massive project recording terabytes and terabytes of data across Australia from hundreds of different devices, have developed a method um, in which they, they reduce the audio data to acoustic indices. 
So it's compressing the audio data to a series of acoustic indices. And they've they found a way of doing this that they can still extract the most relevant ecological data. And this saves them six to eight times the storage space. Although they are for now, at least, and I think they're intending to forever to keep their originals as well. So it's just an, a quick way of retrieving some of the data. Um, I think for, for our case study, in this case, I would potentially uh, buy one solid state disk and two hard drives as the cheapest, quickest option uh, and store data on there. And I think I would also look at uploading my data to the Arbonne platform, which is currently free and hopefully will remain free uh, as, a, as a good cloud backup option as well. Uh, so we now have a study design set up. We've gone through everything we needed uh, to uh, go out and prior to collecting data. So we can listen to the sounds that we'd hear whilst we're collecting data. This is sort of a sample of uh, a recording taken very close to that nature reserve. So some skylarks, a rear pheasant, a few bits and bobs on there, so quite nice. But you can also see that um, just collecting the acoustic data is, is only the very start of the problem, really. Uh, this is not necessarily a simple process to analyze. It, it's a complex plot. Uh, for people that aren't necessarily familiar with spectrograms, you have frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And uh, the color represents the amplitude, the power of the signal going through. So you can see there's a lot of complex signals going on in a relatively short amount of time. And we're hoping to collect hundreds of hours of data. No, don't want to play it again. Uh, so once you've collected uh, a decent chunk of data, the first problem you uh, come across is data exploration. You want to know what that data looks like. Um, and the first thing I always want to do is work out whether the data looks how I expected it to look. Um, there are various pack R packages and audio data handling tools that can uh, bring in files and, and check them. You can devise, uh, it's fairly straightforward to devise your own pipelines in R. But to be very basic, I'm worried about this sounding a bit condescending, but actually just putting things in Windows Explorer, increasing the number of columns that you can see and looking through the data you've collected is a great way of spotting problems that the recorders might have had. If they've cut short, if the file length's not right, if the bit rate is wrong, uh, I've spotted numerous problems with recordings like this and caused myself, save myself problems downstream. So I think it's really worth a few minutes just doing very basic uh, very simple data checking to make sure that the data looks like how you expect it to look. Uh, and then the second step of, of data exploration is going to be exploring the spectrograms a little bit. For me, I always want to know what sort of sounds we've captured, what the soundscape looks like and get a feel for it before I go on to any automated analysis. Um, I think it's incredibly useful to, to get an idea of how species rich or species poor soundscapes are what sort of sounds dominate, what sort of frequencies and how that changes a bit over time, at least before diving into any sort of automated analysis. And the best way of doing that is in spectrograms. Uh, it's the basic tool of ecoacoustics, really, the spectrogram. And the, there's multiple programs to do them in, ranging from uh, free ones like Audacity, which are very functional, very useful, uh, and then paid, paid for ones, Kaleidoscope, Raven, um, and you can make your own in R or Python. Uh, it's a very simple process to do this. You, you'll inevitably try a few and find find your favorite method. I favor Raven, but it's, it's really personal choice. Uh, and then the limitation of spectrograms really is that as soon as you try and include a long period of time, so for instance, this is 30 seconds, but if you try to look at a minute, uh, five minutes or so, all of that information becomes so compressed along the x-axis, it's very difficult to make out uh, very clear patterns. And a clever way of, of displaying uh, longer periods of time is using false color spectrograms where the audio data, again, is compressed using acoustic indices. And then you build an image, but replacing the red, green, and blue channels of, of a color image with the acoustic index values and that allows you to display much longer periods of time along the x-axis 
So for here, I believe the, the top image there is a, is a 24 hour false color spectrogram. And you can see the orange colors there representing uh, increased acoustic energy, which is the dawn chorus. And then the, the longer horizontal uh, structures on either end, I think is the cicada chorusing, because I think this is from Borneo. Um, and then uh, to take that even further, you can use the false color plot. So that's where you lose frequency on the y-axis and you replace that with your DL cycle. And then you can start to look at seasonal changes over time. So for instance, you can see that, uh, again, you can see that the DL cycle is relatively consistent throughout the year. You've got those purple um, periods at, through the night, and then it's a lot more active in uh, the middle of May than it is at the uh, earlier on in April. And then another aspect of data exploration you may want to consider is which data you actually want to take into your analysis and which data you want to use. Uh, this is going to be heavily dependent on what your ultimate analysis is. Um, so some of the things you may want to consider removing are geophony, uh, which really just means wind and rain noise most of the time, um, which can block out a lot of environmental signals. So but there is some debate here if you're doing a soundscape analysis. Some people will argue that that wind and rain noise is an inherent part of the soundscape. It can be reflective of a, a landscape's characteristics. So it may be something you want to leave in and uh, include in your acoustic index values. Uh, alternatively, in most uh, targeted taxonomic studies, it's not very useful to have periods where you can't actually detect those taxa because of the wind and rain. So you want to remove that from the data. Um, there are some automated processes to do that. I developed a small R package called Hard Rain, which is really designed for tropical rainstorms rather than showers in the UK, but may work to an extent. Uh, there's some more complex CNN processes, but it is often easier to do it manually or to, to keep an eye on the weather forecast and, and note when it's raining or very windy and just remove that manually uh, as you go through. For now, I'm sure with AI that will get easier as we go through. Uh, and then the, the final uh, sort of elephant in the room in, in this, this field really is uh, human privacy concerns uh, and whether if you're recording identifiable conversations, whether you're going to have GDPR issues. In the guidelines, we, we don't make any explicit recommendations. We just highlight it as, as a consideration. Um, again, there's a couple of CNNs that can be used. Uh, deep learning models, sorry. CNN is a deep learning model deep learning model to recognize human voices, at which point they can be, those files can be removed from analysis. It's quite difficult to just remove the human voices and leave the rest of the file alone. Um, and again, I think in general, if this is likely to be a concern for your study, it's possibly better just to um, deploy recorders in areas where you're not likely to get human interaction and at record at times when humans are unlikely to be having conversations. So very early in the morning or late in the evening, uh, and you're much less likely to come across those problems. And then finally, we need to move on to the analysis that we are looking at. Um, so the targeted monitoring, as we discussed before, we'll deal with that first. So that's uh, when you want to identify and target specific species. Um, for these sort of analyses, it's important to identify what, eco what species are ecologically relevant to your study, why you want to target them, uh, and whether it should be a community, a mix of species, or a single species. It's almost always much easier to identify a single species, much less time consuming than it is an entire community. Uh, and again, it's much easier to uh, assess uh, presence absence than it is uh, more complex metrics like abundance or occupancy. So it's worth giving a bit of thought uh, into exactly what you want to get out of the study right at the outset. Um, and your options here for doing this sort of analysis include manual analysis, uh, that should read event detection, template matching, and automated or semi-automated classification. And I'll talk a little bit about each of those now. So manual analysis, this is uh, sampling your audio data and having an expert listen to that data and uh, labeling it for what species are present. There's been quite a lot of studies now. This is probably the best review of um, bird species richness showing uh, manual studies against uh, studies done with autonomous recording units uh, that show that autonomous recording units are often a more effective way of sampling species richness. 
than uh, traditional point count or uh, transect surveys, uh, which sort of agrees with what we found in our white paper with uh, Baker Consultants that will be coming out uh, that Gav mentioned at the start. Uh, and there are a wide range of these studies. There are lots of contextual uh, considerations, but in most cases, you're not going to make your analysis worse by using passive acoustic monitoring compared to using a, uh, a surveyor in the field. Although you are going to bias the species composition in a different direction to the way it's biased from having a human in the field. Um, and it can be a very fast and efficient way of collecting community data, but as a word of warning, it's not easy to identify species from audio. It shouldn't be treated as a, a simple task and it will recre require someone with a high degree of expertise to do so, especially for um, species rich communities of, of birds. Uh, I think that's likely to be the only group in the UK that's going to have a highly diverse vocal repertoire. Uh, we'll move on to event detection. So event detection is quite often lumped in with classification, although it is somewhat distinct. I think it would be better if we made a clearer distinction between classification and event detection. Um, so event detection in the way that it's used in the guidelines is just the detection of um, acoustic signals. So something has made a sound it's increased the amplitude and decreased the amp amplitude in a in a single event and these are a range of algorithms that will find that um and it can be a really useful first step prior to classification or it can be a valuable way to save um effort in manual assessment if you know you've got long periods of silence that you don't want to analyze just using event detection to pull out uh, when things have actually happened can be quite useful Alternatively, uh, so the example given here is Tadarida D, which is some software developed by Eve Barr at the French Natural History Museum. So in this case, it detects these acoustic events. The acoustic events are the pink lines. Uh, the green is the detected, green, black, and red are detected events. And then it takes 270 measurements of each acoustic event, which can be used later further down the analysis pipeline in a random forest to classify uh, the cause of each event. Uh, there are also um, energy detectors in things like Raven, where you can put in such specific parameters. So for things like Cuckoo, there's not much calling at very low frequencies down there. So if you can fit the parameters of event detection, so it's looking for two signals in quick succession after each other at the right frequency, it essentially works like a classifier because there's so little else uh, vocalizing in those in those frequency ranges but it's not doing any sort of smart learning, intelligent things. It's just looking for an increase and decrease in uh, energy at those frequencies that you're telling it to look for. Uh, the next option is template matching. So template matching can be very straightforward in that you don't need much training data. You just highlight a region in your uh, spectrogram that is the bird call or the uh, amphibian call or whatever you're looking for, and then you do a cross correlation across all of the rest of your data. And when the correlation hits a certain threshold, that counts as a detection. Um, so it can be very useful. Uh, there are some good software. Arbmon functionality has, Arbmon have this as very functional, very quick analysis. Um, although as a word of warning, if you choose to do it in R, the monitor program runs quite slowly unless you're good at parallelizing it uses up quite a lot of memory, so it can be quite challenging on that front. Um, it's unlikely to be as accurate as machine or deep learning. It tends to have quite a low recall. That means it misses quite a lot of calls, and it can have quite a high false, false positive rate, so that means it's it's getting a lot wrong. So it will probably require a higher amount of manual validation than some of the uh, smarter classification approaches, but that's sort of made up for by being so quick to set up in the first place. And then finally, the automated and semi-automated classification. Uh, at the outset, these are essentially the same things, but then the semi-automated classification is when you take all of the positive predictions uh, from a, a classification model and you manually go through those to remove any false positives. So you get a higher degree of accuracy, but it's more human effort. Um, so this approach ranges from sort of machine learning approaches using random forests where you're deciding what the features are that should be classified 
to um, cutting edge uh, RCNN models. Um, so that's the, the cutting edge of deep learning, uh, where the, the algorithm itself is deciding which features are the most important to determine and classify uh, the source of the sounds on. These can be trained independently. There's lots of packages now for uh, this sort of thing. Uh, there's the open soundscape package in Python is quite useful. Uh, there's quite a few R packages, and I think they'll be becoming increasingly user friendly. But here in Europe, we're very fortunate in that there's some very effective off the shelf classifiers. Um, for instance, Birdner Analyzer, developed by the Cornell team, uh, you can run over large chunks of data, uh, especially if it's non commercial. I think it's not possible to get a commercial license for this at the moment, um, directly at least. Um, but it can be very accurate, but it will require, it will still require independent manually labeled test sets. You can't just use, because it worked for somebody else with X accuracy, it doesn't necessarily mean it will work the same for your data with different uh, recording devices, different recording parameters. So it still require a degree of manual valid validation. Um, yeah, and then I've just got an example of how BirdNet runs. Uh, Oli, just to, sorry to interrupt. Um, we're, we're kind of running slightly over time. Is it? Is it, it. I, I thought I'd give you a two minute warning. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, hang on. I went out of the shit. Oh, I am screen sharing. Let's go back in. I didn't. Okay, so you can see. Oh, this is not helping. <laughs> uh okay sorry i put you off <laughs> yeah no worries so you can see the efficacy of birdnet compared to uh manual labeling isn't perfect and then i was going to say the other approach that's often taken is uh the clustering tools that are available in things like kaleidoscope is another good approach to take uh and the data from that can be used in things like simple presence absolute modeling community analysis occupancy models, localization, and abundance density, although the latter two are very tricky. So with the curlews, I would probably just use BirdNet, or I believe the BTO are bringing out a new available classifier. And for the Natajack toads, Open Soundscape has a stridulation finder model, which you could run over and find all the stridulations and use to compare relative abundance. Uh, so very quickly, one minute on soundscape analysis. So this is uh, a suite of analyses that consider the whole soundscape so this is massively cost efficient because there's no taxonomic identification. Uh, all you're trying to do is quantify the variation in energy within recordings. Uh, and these are predicated on the acoustic niche hypothesis, which is well illustrated in this image here, where you can see it looks like at least the animals that are sonifying are forming their own niches at different frequencies so they don't compete with each other. Uh, you can then use a series of mathematical uh, equations, models to calculate values based on how the variation in acoustic energy changes. There's over 80 of these available now. Uh, we've got a fairly good list in the guidelines of the commonest ones. And you can see that actually they're very good at pulling out some basic biological trends. So you can see in the plot here, it's regularly picking out dawn choruses, the variation from in sound from midday to mid midnight. And they're very good at, at using as features in classifiers to predict uh, landscape use as well. Uh, but they can be incredibly difficult to interpret. Uh, we've just got a paper out on using acoustic indices in ecology, a guidance on study design analysis interpretation, which is well worth a look at. But you can see here, this is from our, stud, uh, our case study study site, and you can see at nine o'clock, you've got completely quiet, a little bit of wind noise and some bat passes due to aliasing, uh, and then high levels of wind noise by 11 o'clock, uh, and then rainfall at 1 a.m., and then by 5 a.m. is dawn chorus, and these... These are the same times we've got A, B, C, and D in the top plot. And it's not entirely clear that those indices scores are changing in line with any of those or exactly what's happening and what's correlating to the uh, index scores. And there's increasingly uh, concerns about how well acoustic indices correlate with biodiversity. Just blunt correlations or even linear models relating uh, a known metric of uh, by ecological diversity, such as alpha richness, and acoustic indice scores often seem not to work, or at least not to generalize beyond a single site. Um, more sophisticated ways of using acoustic indices include um, using embeddings from CNNs. This is just prior to them making the classification. They create these uh, vectors of what the 
uh, soundscapes look like, and you can put those into UMAPs. So you get these visual representations of how similar soundscapes are. And you can also do things like acoustic space use. Uh, Thomas Lupart has just uh, completed his PhD. It's well worth looking at his papers. So if you use the acoustic space use, grid your soundscape and treat each cell in that grid as a operational sound unit, then you can look at alpha diversity, beta diversity turnover uh, using the Hill number uh, paradigm, which is very useful in ecology. So sorry, I had, very, had to very much rush through those last few minutes. Um, do go and check out the Good Practice Guidelines. It's all there and it's a lot better laid out. Uh, I don't know if we still have time for any questions or not. Oh, we can, we can, we can force a few questions in. I'm, well, I'm, I'm <laughs> in the duration, so yeah. <laughs> we're here, we're here all day. It's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we, we've got a few, uh, we're one <laughs> that, that came through. Um, hard Rain, was that an R package or in, in a CNN? It's an R package. There are some CNNs that are a lot more effective and a lot more generalizable than what I did, um, but they they look a lot more complex to run, whereas mine is a very simple, very stupid one line of R code that will give you an answer uh, quickly. So actually, going back to your, your your the case study that you gave examples on, this is probably a question for both of you, really. You know, you, you picked out your 10 or 20 recorders that you're going to place out over a, a, your nature reserve. Um, would you put them in the same location, leave them there all year and keep going back to it? Or would you move them around? I would I would leave them. You'd leave them in the same place? Yeah. Well, I think... I'm looking at Gavin now. Is he going to do the same Agreed. thing? Yeah, Agreed. absolutely. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I, I kind of... You mentioned geophony, and you also mentioned landscape character assessment and this this kind of got a lot of things sort of um spinning in my mind that so I've, I've been doing something for the peak district national park which is to create uh, uh sounds of the peak district national park and place them onto a map and people can listen to them a lot of the time i get motorbikes and things like that you know all the things that you don't want you um but could we put, possibly use this as part of a landscape character assessment i mean can we use this kind of technology as to further landscape character assessment as the sound of the landscape? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think absolutely. The, the, they did a really interesting assessment on this, on the um, the rewilding projects in the Yorkshire Dales. Um, oh, it's one of the three peaks, I've forgotten its name. Ing Ingebra, the Ingebra acoustic project did a really interesting soundscape assessment, uh, looking at things like motorbike noise uh, and acoustic index values. And I think it's really cool. And also if you, if you do it in a much more computationally sophisticated way you can uh Sarab Sethi did use that UMAP you know those last UMAPs I showed you where it, it mapped the acoustic index scores and he did that to then find outlying values so in, he was in the Bornean rainforest so he was looking for chainsaws and and you know it, it really picked out the sound of chainsaws and an occasional thing but actually if you knew which of your recordings had things like motorbikes you could see how much of an outlier or, or not it was in different soundscapes so it give you an idea of whether they're they're really just a common part of that soundscape that that's sort of regular sound pollution or if it's an occasional event that's that's something that's like a one-off I, I hate to say it, that's a whole new batch of papers you're gonna have to write you um, not me someone else <laughs> <laughs> um I, I i i've got a couple of questions but i just want to Quick, quickly, I suppose. Would you advise? I'm biased on this, so I can't say. <laughs> would you advise using Arbimon or Kaleidoscope for bird analysis, based on the fact that you said R runs slowly with Arbimon template match data? Okay, so R, R and Arbimon are independent. So R has a package called Mon Monitor with a capital R at the end, uh, which is a great package but it can be extremely slow to run over large amounts of data unless you're good at parallelizing across multiple machines, which I'm not good at. So that's the completely free, can do it on your own desktop option in R. Then you have two options on top of that. I don't think Kaleidoscope does template matching. I think what it does is clustering, which is, is subtly different, but very useful. I've not used Kaleidoscope, but I know lots of people that have and have found it very easy and quick to use. It's, it's definitely, it's the most expensive option, but what it'll do is it'll, if you give it some frequency parameters and that sort of thing and length of sound it's looking for, it will then group different sounds together so that you get the similar sound. So you only have to look at the first few to work out, okay, that sound is yellow hammer and that sound is robin and that sound is blackbird. And then you can assume that all the sounds in that cluster are that species, assuming that the clusterings work well. 
So that's what Kaleidoscope does. It's very good at that. People publish papers out of that. It costs money, sometimes quite a lot of money, sometimes a bit less. There's a grant program. You might be able to get it for free if you're lucky. Uh, Arbonmon at the moment is completely free, but it doesn't run locally on your on your laptop. You'll have to spend the time getting all your data up onto the cloud. And they have a very quick, very effective uh, template matching. And then after that, Random Forest and potentially in the future, uh, CNN's on there as well. So it's a great way of sharing data. It, it's more upfront time cost on getting everything onto Arbonmon in the first place. And also, I mean, they sound very confident. I don't understand the business model that lets them keep on giving away infinite amounts of data storage for free forever. <laughs> but that's that's their problem, not mine. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly, our large data, we are, we're using it a little bit now to analyze some data, but we're certainly not the only place we're storing our data. Cool. Um, I think we could probably draw it to a close. I thought Amy's just put something in the chat, which is really interesting. Has anyone analysed historical recordings, e.g. old LPs of birdsong and dawn chorus compared with modern day? I, I did something with uh, Ludwig Koch's first ever recording of, I can't remember what bird it is now. Um, it's the first ever recorded it's on a wax cylinder, so b before LP. And obviously it's been digitised. And I've actually looked at the sonograms on it and it, it looks it looks great. <laughs> you know, nice. a lot of hiss. A single to noise ratio is pretty awful. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, I don't I can't think of anything like that. I know there was a there was a study by I think it was BTO researchers mostly who who replicated old soundscapes by looking at the um the abundance of different species sort of I think it was 70 years ago, just post-war, and they they created a soundscape with the same abundance levels of species. As as there was then, and compared it to the soundscapes of with the current bird abundances, and and, and did that analysis. But I can't think of any published papers that have done anything with old recordings personally. No, I on, was, a, on, on, a related, on a related note, what I was going to say is, once it's not old, old bird song or chorus records, what we have been doing with um, our old, I say old, you know, more than two year old data, where we've been collecting data on. SM2s, SM3s, and all the static bat detectors for our bat transect surveys and our static point recordings, we've started running some of that old bat data through some of our bird um, analysis, and we've started to pull out some bird species calls from that and vice versa. So whilst it's not going back historically in sort of modern history, in the last 10 years, we're able to go back to our old sound files where we had good enough recordings and pull out extra species that were sort of a bycatch of the original purpose of the assessment. So it does open up a, the opportunity to look backwards, provided you get the right data. Yeah, I think Stuart Newson at BTO was doing, he did something very similar. He was supposed to be just doing bats and then found a load of crickets in his calls and owls and small mammals and things like that. So he started started doing the same thing and ridiculous amounts of data. So basically, don't throw anything away. Go through all your um, old data. Oh, um, someone's just put on what uh, Ludwig Cox bird was a uh, white rump sharma bird. Yes, I now remember. Thank you very much for that. Um I think we're probably going to have to draw this to a close as much as that. I think all of us would like to carry on um, kind of forever, really. I'm, I'm quite in, I'm quite enjoying the discussion. Um, but I, I think uh, we, we should sort of um, draw things a, a little bit to, to, a, to a close right now. Um, I'm not actually sharing my screen, am I? Oh, schoolboy error. Let me just share my screen. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can keep me off. It's all right. <laughs> Hey, there we go. Um, I, again, it's really a slide for for Gavin here. I don't know if you want to mention what's coming soon, which is uh, this white paper. Yeah, sure. So as I said briefly in the introduction, over the last three years, I would say our last three seasons, we've been deploying static acoustic recorders for all of our bird surveys. Um, some of it uh, because clients are asked for it, and some of it as an aside to collect just to inform this sort of work. Um, and over the last sort of nine months with Ollie's help, um, Ollie and Carlos have been working through the data that we've been collecting, trying to provide some benchmark between the quality of data that you get from manual transect breeding bird surveys and wintering bird surveys, and how that compares with the sort of data that we get from our static detectors. Um, and it should hopefully be released um, through ourselves within the next week. And then we think it'll then be available through the AER portal um, within a month. Um, and it looks across, I think there's six test sites, some upland, some lowland, some pasture, some woodland. And it looks at the differences in species richness, species lists, 
um, and relative abundance because obviously the transects are one-offs where the statics are out for weeks at a time. And it provides some really compelling evidence that you don't need a very high density of static data to start collecting additional species of birds. It's particularly good for the um, dusk, dawn and nighttime species because, um, you know, we don't see a lot of birds flying at night, but we get a lot of calls coming through on the recorders. Um, and we've been testing different sampling strategies that Ollie walked you through earlier in terms of full, fully blocking dusk and dawn or doing two in 10 or one in five minute recording patterns. And it shows, uh, gives some idea as to what level of density of detectors you need to achieve a, an improvement in the quality of your data. And in almost all settings, we found that by using static detectors, we added extra species to our species list, which gives you a, a more clear and truer picture of the value of your site for birds, in, in our case, from a consultancy point of view. And it also pleasingly helps to show that, you know, ornithologists know what they're doing and we get the, the peak of calls of the birds that we're finding during the breeding time and um, feeding time. So it's, um you know, thoroughly endorsed by us and hopefully uh, the white paper will be of interest to quite a lot of you. Yeah, th thank you very much for that. And I mean, really, this goes out to to anybody else. I think your organisation sort of uh, uh, reports and guidelines should be part of sort of the everyday evidence based um, uh, approach. Then the support calls, j j please inquire a AR membership um, at the it says it on the bottom of the of the page there. Hello, at <laughs> um, because we want more of this. This is um, absolutely um, fantastic. So, uh, this is pretty much bringing AER live to a close. Um, thanks, um, Oliver, Gavin, much appreciated. Uh, everyone that's joined us today, of course, the AR team in the background. There's lots of elves that have been made made all this sort of like possible and made it run um, incredibly smoothly. There's a lot of prep that goes onto that, so thank you very much um, for that as well. Um, I've got to thank myself again, which I find, find is a bit bit um, odd, but I've got to. I've, I'm, I'm kind of. I'll, I'll shut myself up as well. So, oh. Technology, eh? God, soundscapes. Um, so, uh, but if you do go to the Wildlife Acoustics website, we have lots of We offer free training courses on uh, acoustic analysis and lots of and, and also bat analysis as well. If you're into that bat side of things, including acoustic indices, which Oli touched on a, a little bit earlier. So please come along. It's all free, um, and you'll get to a bunch of people like you just met. Today. So thank you very much, everybody, for for turning up and. Um, roll on next year for a, a load more sessions. So I shall leave you with the um, beautiful sounds of the Borneo rainforest. Right?